My name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living. And today we are overhauling a saxophone together. This is part five. Uh, and today we are going to go ahead and start cleaning the keys. Cleaning is gonna be a multi-step process that um, for me starts with using naphtha, N-A-P-T-H-A, on uh, the keys and parts of the instrument body itself to get sort of the most resistant grime and old grease and stuff off of it. Now, naphtha is a dry cleaning fluid. And what that means is that when you use it, it dries, right? So you don't have to rinse it off. Um, you can clean things off with it and then it evaporates. So you'll notice, so I've got some pipe cleaners here. Um, these are actual pipe cleaners. They've got bristles in them. Um, these are made by a company that they used to be called BJ Long. I guess they finally got tired of that <laughs> name being silly um, and recently changed their name. But these are the pipe cleaners I use. This is regular old naphtha and a dispenser made by Menda, M-E-N-D-A. Um, and what I do is I put some naphtha on the front end and the back end. And the reason is that I can take the pipe cleaners, pull them through, and see how we've got a little bit of dirt on the front end there and none on the back end. I can continue to clip this off and keep using it as it gets shorter. And the clean back end shows me that I got all the stuff off. If I just had the front end, I wouldn't know if there was still any, uh, you know, debris uh, or anything in there. So I'm doing the rollers right now. Speaking of rollers, you may have uh, watched the really, really long uh, video I did where I failed to extract a stuck roller. And yeah, I'm still thinking about that. You know, like what could I have done differently? Like are there things I could have done that would have made that situation have a better outcome? Could I have maybe like bent like one of the, like the pieces of the key to give myself a little bit of purchase, use a really thin saw blade, like sawed it clear and then punched it out like I did in a, another video with con rollers. Um, those, I did that too because I actually had that kind of room to start with. I didn't have to bend the stuff too much. I did a little bit, but this was so flush. Also, it cracked under relatively little pressure, so I guess that's a little bit of a balm, uh, is that, you know, I think if I had tried to do something forceful like that, like saw it out and then punch out the um, rod, it might have just shattered anyhow. But I don't know if that was the best way. I don't know if that was the best possible outcome. It sort of feels like it probably wasn't. But um, you know, that sort of stuff happens. And I hopefully am going to be learning from that experience. You know, I'm still thinking about it a lot. It's definitely going to be information that I take forward with me and uh, you know, apply in the future. That's a thing that's happened to me now. That's, that was a new one on me. The, uh, you know, the level of frozen that that rod was to that post, or sorry, to that um, roller, while also the roller was not seeming to have any like super bad effects from being heated up, like super hot, but it also didn't let go. It's all new to me. Um, and I guess that's like sort of an important thing about this series of videos is like, this is not sanitized. I'm doing it in real time, which is kind of nerve wracking, right? But, um, you know, I'm not trying to like sanitize this and show you how to do the job. I'm just showing you what the job is. We're doing this job together. And it's kind of like what you would be getting if you were an apprentice in a shop. Um, except, you know, if I had an apprentice in my shop and screwed up in front of them, um, you know, they might know me, they might trust me from other situations, um, you know, they might give me the benefit of the doubt here. It's kind of just all open. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, being judged on the internet is kind of just like a thing that happens these days if you do anything on the internet. So I'll just have to deal with it. Probably my career isn't over from perhaps not dealing with a stuck roller the best way. And of course, one of the things that's nice about this whole project is this is my saxophone. So um, although I still have a lot of sort of doubts and regrets over what I did with that roller, at least 
it's really only uh, me that has to suffer if I don't end up uh, fixing a problem the right way, at least for now. You know, ideally when you do repairs, you're thinking of the next person to touch it, the next person to repair it, and trying to make things easy for them, trying to take care of problems, um, you know, because that way the owner of the instrument, you know, no matter where they go to get it fixed, you know, um, they're likely to get a better job, right? If you don't leave um, cans of worms waiting uh, for the next person to touch it. But that uh, that one's still sticking with me, and I'm sure by the time, because I'm I'm actually recording this before that one gets published, so probably uh, I will be hearing some from some folks about that. I imagine. All right, if you want to pause it and uh, mute, because this will probably be loud when I get this stuff out. All right, that wasn't too bad, but who knows what the microphone picked up. Okay, so the thing I want to do here is clean out the insides of these hinge tubes and the ends too. You can wash an instrument, and we will be doing that later, but it doesn't get to this stuff. And typically I do this stuff first. <clears throat> Pardon me. I do this stuff first before uh, you know washing it for two reasons. Um, one, washing will not get to this stuff. You really do need like a solvent to get the grease and grime out of here. Um, and two, this stuff will leave like little fibers um, behind. No matter how much you don't want that to happen, it will end up happening. Wow, it's a lot of grease in that one. So probably when I pull this through, we'll see if this shows that I actually got it clean or not. Looks like I did. But now I'll snip that part off because I don't want to just like transfer grime to another bit. Um, but yeah, so that getting this stuff off first before you wash it seems to end up in a better result with the washing. Um, but also it gets rid of all the little hairs and stuff that you leave behind. Now I will also usually like do the ends of the hinge tubes too. Because again, this kind of grime that is from like key oil that gets built up over time, that's much cleaner, right? Doesn't really seem to come off uh, from just regular washing. And it's also like hinge tubes are different sizes. I try to like keep, I do the same size, like with the same, um, so that's a pivot. I try to do the same size with uh, the same um, pipe cleaner. So I don't end up just like shrinking down my pipe cleaner and then not getting as much like actual washing as I want. And here I'm taking a cotton swab and cleaning out the inside. Oh, that's the place. That's the roller, isn't it? Yep. From the site of my humiliation and disappointment. There we go. Um, also for... So this is a pivot rod, right? So it doesn't go all the way through. We just have a shaped receiver on either side. And this one goes really deep. So that's interesting to note. Huh, that's weird. wonder what the deal is there. Pretty clean too. It's not like getting out a whole bunch of grime on this particular one. It looks like it's shaped. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, so it's got like a matching taper on the inside to the pivot screws, but it's also got like a really long, like large hole drilled like deeper. So I guess the, um, you know, the pivot screw goes to about maybe here. The head of the pivot screw would go from there to there. But then it looks like it's got a long drilled piece down to here. And that can be like an oil reserve. It can also sort of... Um, you know, when you screw it in, if it mates really well, um, it can actually like pressurize, you know, and it like, especially if it's just liquid, since liquid doesn't really compress when you screw it in, if you don't have a little repository in the bottom, you can actually sort of get like a hydro lock. Um, if it's mated like precisely. Um, so usually there'll be like a little tiny reservoir in the bottom, um, 
to allow that to not happen. Pretty grimy, huh? But again, having naphtha on the back end of it allows you to see whether you've actually cleaned it. Looks like I did, although I'm kind of surprised. And I can use this again for a short key like this one. I'm going to try and do this kind of speedy. I mean, I did say I would let you guys see the whole thing, but this kind of feels like a job where I might run out of things to say about it. Oops, did I do the wrong end? I think I did. So I'll find another key that has a small hinge tube. And again, with this naphtha stuff, um, it's basically lighter fluid. I think the Ronsonol lighter fluid that seems to be able to be found in lots of places um, is basically naphtha with like maybe one additive. Um, but this is a like varnish makers and varnish and paint makers thinner um, that is typically available in hardware stores. But if you can't get that, um, lighter fluid like Ronsonol, like Zippo lighter fluid seems to work okay from what I've heard. I haven't actually used it myself but it seems to be basically the same thing and I've heard that it works well. Um, as far as like denatured alcohol I don't think that works nearly as well and I think that has the added danger and again I haven't actually done this myself but I think that has the added danger of possibly damaging lacquer sometimes. So you have to be careful of that. And let's see, actually, did I do all the ends of the hinge tubes on these? I don't think I did. I think I got lost talking. Don't typically have a whole lot of conversation going on in the shop because I work alone. Doesn't stop me from talking to myself sometimes, but not quite this much. Okay, let's keep going. Let's see, what else can I talk about while I'm doing this? So this process, this is actually also part of like the clean oil adjust, um, which you may have seen in that video, if you, if you watch that one. Um, this is, for me, this is kind of the starting point for any job where I need to clean it at all. And also when I take instruments apart, like even partially, um, I will typically do this to get out the old oil. No reason why not to, it just takes a minute, right? Um, so that the instrument, so that when I put it back together, I'm not just like reintroducing like grime and grit that was already there. That might be overkill, but you know, if you take off a stack, and you're redoing a bunch of stuff on it. Um, cleaning the hinge tubes just does not take that much time compared to how much you're already spending. And it seems like a uh, worthwhile expenditure. I mean, I guess that's one of the things that you're sort of constantly thinking of when you're doing this is like, is this a reasonable expenditure of time? Like, is the client getting like a good value for their dollar? At least I hope you're thinking that. Um, so you kind of have to really believe in your you know, choices and your work and what you're doing. I mean, you're never going to be perfect, right? I mean, like yesterday, what happened with the roller, um, yeah, that's a real disappointment. And I think, you know, in the beginning of my career, I just, I mean, I still, I still do this. I guess I'm suffering less because of it, but the way I charge is typically like, all right, how should this go? You know, how long should this take if I'm not making any major mistakes, right? Um, 
you know, like what is what is reasonable to expect someone who does this job well? Um, you know, because bad luck happens, right? Like that that's that's true, but there's definitely things would go better if I knew what I was doing more, right? So in the beginning of my career, um, you know, I was actually getting, I don't know, some percentage of the hours that I charged were actually, you know, I guess some percentage of the, of the hours I took was actually what I would charge because I felt like it should have gone better. Now that I've been doing this 20 years, it feels like, you know, it's a reasonable assumption that, like, I kind of know what I'm doing. Um, if things go poorly, uh, you know, and I can tell that it's not my fault, well, then that's just, like, the way the cookie crumbled, right? Like, ideally, I can minimize that, but, like, yesterday with the roller, I guess I'd be kind of making a decision. It's like, all right, so, you know, how much time should I spend on this? Um, how, you know, how much is it worth it to the client? I probably would have called them if that was a client horn and been like, hey, like, I've got this one roller that's stuck. I think I can make a reproduction that looks pretty good. Um, you know, how long do you want me to spend on this? Um, when in doubt, you know, call the client, tell them as much information as you can um, and help, you know, help them be empowered to make a decision on their own. But all that to say, you know, like, if I screw up on something, like, it should have gone faster. I typically don't charge for that time. Um, the bad luck thing is where it's sort of a gray area. It feels like, you know, like, hopefully it just doesn't happen often enough that I need to think about it too much because that does seem sort of like a ethical decision that can be difficult, you know, like, should bad luck be out of my pocket entirely? The client's pocket, split evenly, split somewhere. I think I probably usually split it these days. I think I used to assume that bad luck was probably um, the lack of skill on my part. These days, I think I assume that a little less, although I was actually just having a conversation with a colleague the other day where like I saw somebody, you know, do, do I saw somebody that I had a lot of assumptions about their you know, level of skill because of like things I'd heard and things I'd seen, um, you know, but it, it turned out that I was like not quite as impressed as I expected to be. And there's that, you know, that saying never meet your heroes. I think that has a lot to do with it, but like, you know, um, I just sort of always assume that like, I don't really know what I'm doing. Right. Like, and other people, other people, say they do so they must because if i did i'd probably say that but um i think like a, a level of humility perhaps it doesn't need to be like as you know intense as to be nearly debilitating um and you know veering into self-doubt territory uh like mine is but i think that having a bit of humility uh in this job keeps you sharp keeps you learning um keeps you wondering, keeps you excited, and, you know, has you more likely, I think, to do a decent job. This is a messed up. doesn't even have the stuff in it. Okay. I think it's important for, for this kind of job. So if you, you know, if you're too proud of yourself, if you're too full of yourself, um, you're probably going to miss some stuff that, you know, best case scenario, you're going to miss some stuff the horns could teach you. Uh, worst case scenario and probably more likely um, you're just going to do not a great job because there's just so much in these horns to like mess with and do and fix and make better it's a bit tiring i guess you know like it's not probably not for everybody to have a job like that i know people that um you know i consider very smart considerate like interesting you know thoughtful people that want a job that they don't really have to like think a whole lot for um and i think the older i get the more i understand that although it's just not how i am i think i get bored with that really fast and for me being bored is worse than being frustrated <laughs> i guess is the short version now if you get a rod that's too long for your pipe cleaner you can just take or sorry a hinge rod um, you can just take the rod that fits in there and push it through it's not a big deal it'll go through it won't get stuck 
No, but I think we can probably push another one through and see what's going on there. There we go. That looks better, huh? Let's get ourselves another clean paper towel. And the video after this, I'm going to be doing basically the same thing to the posts. Um, so feel free to skip that one if you don't want more of the same. But like I said, I'm doing this kind of almost all uncut in real time. So that's part of the job. Also, I guess since I've got a lot of time to talk, I guess like maybe I can talk about sort of philosophical stuff to do with the job. Maybe that's helpful. If it's not, tell me in the comments and I can keep my mouth shut because I am definitely trying to think of things to come up uh, to say that are worthwhile. But sort of like, you know, adjacent to the humility thing, um, you know, sometimes the job is really hard. Like sometimes you're not feeling it. Um, and I think it's usually best to take a break versus like smash your head against the wall. Um, it's taken me a long time to get there. I just sort of wanted to power through. I wanted to like, you know, get to a point before I like quit for the day that I was happy with. And, you know, sometimes that would mean staying up, you know, well past midnight working for days longer than 12 hours. And it just seemed like there's diminishing returns. Um, with that kind of energy expenditure, right? You know, like it meaning I can do twice as much work in an hour well rested than I can tired. I can do twice as much work in an hour happy than I can upset. Um, and if that sounds a bit like, I don't know, touchy feely, um, I hear you, but. It, it's proven true for me and sort of, you know, trying to get myself into the right headspace to do the job has involved uh, giving myself a little bit more space and room than, and, and a bit more, I guess, grace would be the word. Yeah, that's the word. Giving myself a bit more grace than I think um, is my default. So in, in that way, I think it's been good for me in general. But um, it's also definitely makes for better work in my case. Also, I like when I clean keys, sort of like, I don't know, just getting my hands like all over them, feeling all the pieces, like just sort of, I don't know, I feel like it gives me some sort of awareness of the keys that I don't, that I wouldn't get otherwise. I do have um, someone who comes and helps me every once in a while and does cleaning for me. And it's funny because like as, you know, kind of rote as this particular part of the job can be, I'm feeling the keys right now and like sort of their, their weight, like their edges, um, the strength of them, you know, when I hold it here and clean it, I can sort of feel like, is that flexing at all? Like, is that completely rigid? Like, what does that feel like? And that, I think, gives me a lot of information about the horn. The person who's helping me actually um, used to work in a shop. And, you know, when I said I was looking for some help, like one day a week, a few times a month, um, they said they would, and I was like, well, you're going to be bored because I can really, you know, only have you do cleaning. Um, they were like, no, that's okay. So I've actually got someone who sort of knows a, a, a bit about repair already. I'm not sure how long they worked. They're relatively young, but um, I think they, you know, they're probably going to go out on their own relatively soon, as they should. Uh, so probably I'll go back to not having any help and I think I'll probably just keep it that way for a while People ask me about like why don't I have an apprentice I kind of went over that in previous videos Hopefully like this sort of stuff makes up for that. I don't want to feel like I'm not training anybody, you know but um, I don't want to feel like I'm not passing on what I learn. I feel like that's kind of like 
something I owe to the craft, but And also the amount of like grime we're getting out of this. I mean, we saw that that was original pads, right? Um, it's like this horn has been like a part and together and a part and together like a million times. Like this is just like normal grime that builds up. And if you don't clean it out like all the way like this, it does just stick around and um, continue to gum up the works, continue to you know, turn what should be a lubricant, your oil in the keys into an abrasive. I mean, like, this is called lapping compound, right? This is actually like liquid sandpaper, basically. It is oil with an abrasive mixed in. It's a particular type of abrasive of a particular grit. It's non-embedding. There's some special qualities to it. Um, but that's basically what happens inside your keys if you allow the oil to get really dirty. Some of these um, pivot receivers are way deeper than others. So that tells me that um, I'm going to have to look out for like, you know, variations. And I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on where my pivot screws are. And I might have to do some key fitting. And if I do, you know, if one is, if, if I find one is really loose, I wouldn't be surprised to find that like this, you know, I think I've got a video where I did a bushing in a pivot screw or pivot receiver. I wouldn't be surprised if I had to do one of those to make this fit well. Hopefully not, but we'll see. Now we're getting into the octave mechanism. You see sometimes I wipe down those springs. They just tend to be grimy sometimes and just wiping them down just a little bit like that while you're doing this work seems to help quite a bit okay it's pretty clean I think I said before, like, so after I do this job, I mean, there is a lot of naphtha uh, that's getting, you know, it's evaporating into the air and that is captured by these pipe cleaners and the paper towels and stuff. I'm going to take out my trash after this. I've got windows open right now, but um, you will definitely want to do this somewhere well ventilated. You will get used to the smell and it would be shocking if, when you leave the room and come back and you've just been sitting in there and it's like really, really strong smelling of solvent. Um, and it's not good for you. I don't think it's the kind of stuff that like immediately causes you to have like major illness or anything like that, but long-term exposure is not good. So, you know, wear gloves, keep it ventilated and uh, throw out your trash is a big one. Get it outside of your shop, get it you know, outside of uh, interior spaces because it will just continue to slowly evaporate off of uh, the pipe cleaners, which is, I guess, where the majority of this stuff really resides during this job. Oops. And since I've got this in my parts bin here, I'm going to go ahead and clean this as well. So usually I will, you know, Get inside the octave pip, wipe the top down, maybe the edges, get an idea of what that looks like. Um, and I am going to get inside the posts here. So clean out those posts, same way. And then the threaded post, I think, is a place where a lot of grime tends to live and uh, escape notice. You see I'm kind of like screwing it in like that. I was rotating it. That'll actually like help clean out the threads a lot more than just pulling it through. All right. So we have now 
done the naphtha cleaning job on the keys. This is grimy. Um, and next video, I'm going to move on to doing the body, although it's mostly the same concept. Um, but doing this prior to a regular cleaning, uh, I think, makes an enormous difference in how actually clean you get an instrument. Um, and like I said, naphtha, I've got extensive experience with. I have not seen it damage any finish. I think maybe one time there was a finish that was like exceptionally dry, like a like a lacquer that was just really really dried out, um, and uh, it might have like kind of fogged it in a couple places. But that was just a one time thing, and I feel like that lacquer was probably in really bad shape to begin with. But um, I've been using it since I started in this business 20 years ago, and um, that's the only time I've ever seen anything bad happen uh, due to using naphtha. So, my name is Matt Storr. I repair saxophones for a living. Hopefully you found that helpful, useful, and informative. Thanks for watching.